to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's audit committee. Um, we aren't expecting any fire alarms or drills, so if the alarm does go off, if you exit through the front doors down the ramp to the right and assemble adjacent to the cathedral. Um, we'll start as we usually do with a round of introductions. Uh, so we can start with you, Patrick, and we'll go around. Uh, thank you, my name is Patrick Caster, I'm the Council for Halls and Harborside. Terry uh, Peppers, I'm the Councillor for St George Troopers Hill. Uh, Simon Cooks, I'm an independent member. Uh, David Woodcox, Councillor for what, please? John Geeser, Councillor for Aiden Raven Lawrence West. Jonathan Harker, Councillor for Stockwood. So, then I'm Councillor for Phil Woodward. Security partner from Grant Thornton. Richard Young, Head of Strategic Finance. Tony Woodlock, Finance Business Partner. Denise Murray, Director of Finance. Alison Mullis, Deputy Chief Internal Auditor. John Clayton, uh, Capital Finance Accountant. Yeah, Kim Adinus, the Finance Officer. 
Louise Lee, Internal Audit. Bill Heaton is Internal Audit Manager. Naomi to Ferguson, Head of Procurement and Contract Management. Simone Zem, Chief Internal Auditor. <coughs> Alison Taylor Clark to the committee. Um, and I'm Andrew Brown, the Chair of the committee. Um, I'd like to welcome Patrick, who is um, joining the committee um, and taking the place of Councillor Tony Dyer, who is standing down from the committee and also as, well, obviously also as Vice Chair. Um, so I'd like to put on record my thanks to Tony over the past, for his help and support over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, Councillor Wilcox will be becoming Vice Chair. Um, that should have been ratified last week, but obviously the full council was postponed. So, fingers crossed when we get, when that's rearranged, and I understand that's not quite happened yet, um, we shall have that formally um, ratified. Okay, moving on to apologies for absence. Yes, Chair, apologies from Councillor Cole and from Adebola Adebayo, and I note that Councillor Pompey's not yet here. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, do any members have any declarations of interest with regard to today's agenda? No, that's great. Uh, the minutes of the previous meeting. Now, I wasn't here at the last meeting, so I'm looking to members to highlight any issues they may have with the minutes. Which will take silence as um, that's suggesting that they are accurate through a fair and accurate representation. So we shall move on to the action sheet. Do any members have any questions or queries with regards to the actions on the action sheet? I did have one personally. Um, uh, and that is to do with the uh, corporate risk report. There was, a, there, there was an action in, with regards to the ordering of the corporate risk report. And then uh, there seems to have been some discussion around um, whether that should be numerically upwards or numerically downwards. And I think what might have been getting asked for was that they be uh, rated by the highest rated risk first and then in a decreasing um, Order, but I'm looking to members of the committee who may or may not raise that to, to confirm my understanding. Oh. I think I might be the one that asked for it and asked the highest descending. Yeah. yeah, and that's what you mean, that the sort of the one that's you know the highest rated risk as opposed to the highest number, yeah? Highest risk, yeah. So if we Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on, if there's no other comments on the action sheet, uh, we'll move on to public forum. We've had two statements in for public forum, um, one from Mike Aldreve and then um, from Dan. Um, uh, from Dan. So if you can have Mike, if you want to come forward to the mic um, and make your statement um, in a minute, summarise your statement. We, all, we, we have all received it. So members will have actually read the contents, so if you can summarise it, that'd be great. Um, yeah, uh, basically, um, I'd say I believe that the Audit Committee's remit for ensuring good governance means that it must consider the behaviours of the monitoring officer and the head of legal services in their unlawful appointments of independent persons to the members' complaints process. Obviously, that process, the, the scrutiny of that falls within the d &E committee. Um, I mean, I'm concerned that these people were appointed unlawfully. We don't know who they are. The, the monitoring officer has shown so little integrity in his answers to us. We're still waiting for answers to our supplementaries from the 3rd of November. Uh, we've not had an opportunity. He didn't appear at that committee, neither did the independent member. Um, I've been labelled politically motivated by these people. They're nameless, they're not identified. That's clearly not acceptable in any democracy. Um, and the public needs to know. We need clarity rather than a, an attempt to so-called regularise these appointments. We need to know 
and confirmation, were they legally appointed in the past? Because we don't believe they were, and the monitoring officer won't confirm that they were. Were these, the information that was shared with these people, was that lawful to share that information, or was it a breach of our GDPR? Because I didn't consent to any sharing with these people because they weren't legally appointed, so how could I? And also, were the payments made to these people actually lawful items of account? Because under what basis were they made? So I think members of this committee have to actually press for clarity on this rather than try attempting to, as I said, regularise something which is highly irregular. They need to understand what's been going on, what the weaknesses are, and why V and E have been, um, you know, don't seem to have been adequately breaching the law. The section of section seven of the localism act runs to three pages. Can you bring in the max to cross. Yeah, I, I round up, but I mean three pages. So why weren't members adequately appraised of this? This has been going on for since probably 2016, when the last deceased. Thank you. Thank you, and Dan Ackroyd, could you come and give your minutes as well, please? People of Bristol must be able to trust the council will follow the law. Currently, I can't do that. It is intolerable that the monitoring officer, the person who is meant to be promoting integrity and standards in the council, does not appear to be following the law and is refusing to answer questions. If I can't trust this council, then I can't trust that if a letter arrived from the central government in 2017 that said that the gaps reported by tenants did not compromise the structural safety of the building, but did require remedial action to ensure continued fire complementation that such a letter wouldn't simply be chucked in the bin. We need to have trust. Members of the audit committee need to use their position of power to tell the monitoring officer to stop trying to cover up what has happened, no matter how inconvenient it is for members of this committee or the monitoring officer. Well, thank you. Okay, uh, there's no debate on statements, so we'll move on to the next item, which is to note the work programme. Does any members have any comments on the work programme as it's outlined? Okay. Right. So, we're moving on to the reports proper. Now, um, we have until about three o'clock to deal with the first and part of the agenda as we are going to be getting joined by members of resources scrutiny um, and the chair of the people scrutiny at around about three um, to look at item 18. Um, so if it looks like tight, time is tight, I might have to curtail some members um, if they're, if they're um, making overall statements. Um, but the first item on the agenda is the uh, verbal update from Grant Thornton um, on the 21-22 external audit. Thank you, Chair. So I can confirm that we've received all the outstanding information that uh, we've requested. Um, there is one issue in relation to the financial instruments that we just need to review to make sure that all those, uh, all those overall queries have been resolved. We're also waiting for an updated annual governance statement, um, and once that has been received and we've completed all our review procedures, um, then we anticipate issuing the audit opinion um, in the next couple of weeks. Short and sweet, thank you. <laughs> um, do any members have any, any queries on that update? No? Okay, well. Thank you very much for the update and we look forward to um, seeing you again at the next committee. Or maybe not the next one, that's what will be the one after, I guess. Um, right, moving on to item 9, uh, Treasury Management Mid-Year Report, and that's John Clayton. Thank you, Chair. So this is the, uh, the Treasury Management Mid-Year Report. Um, this is one of three reports that have been Treasury Management Strategy Treasury Management Report and this report, the Media Report, and this provides an activity for the first six months of the year. This report is purely for 19 purposes. There are no recommendations in the report. 
in addition, there's no policy changes to the Treasury strategy or the approval of indicators that were approved by full council in February. I can confirm that the council has complied with all the various codes of practice, including the potential code, treasury code, and investment guidance issued by um, central government. The purpose of these codes is to ensure that capital investment decisions are affordable, prudent, and sustainable, and with the agreed parameters approved by full council, including the treasury, borrowing, and investment activity. The key, point, key points in the report are summaries now. Um, the council set up a medium impact to environment of 641 million to support a general fund and new build programs within the HRA. The council has not borrowed any funding during the first part of the year, um, but it's currently planning on borrowing around about 60 million short term borrowing during the last parts of the financial year to support the finance of the capital program and ensure adequate trading resources are available to meet the obligations of the council. Um, the cost of such borrowing is included in, in the MTFB. Borrowing is lower than the anticipated original estimate of 100 million that was set out in the Treasury Management Structure, and this was in part due to delays in the delivery of the capital program. Short term borrowing is planned as interest rates across all maturity, more maturity periods are expected to fall over the coming years when loans are expected to mature, when these loans are refinanced at a lower rate. Treasury balances um, were £116 million at the start of the year and have currently fell to around about £88 million at the midpoint, um, with trade balance expected to be to circa £50 million at the end of the financial year, based on changes to um, working capital, use of reserves and the delivery of the capital programme. Our Treasury investments are invested in highly rated and liquid mark money market funds along with fixed deposits uh, and other local authorities and banks. And these would be a longer, a longer duration to pick up some additional yield, but also be staggered so further receipts will you know, also flip deliveries so it meets certain obligations when they fall due. Uh, the table at paragraph 12 on, on the pack on page 23 provides you with a summary of our um, debt and investments at a high level. Uh, there's also a Economic update also on page 23, giving the commentary of the um, past six months of the year. The current report indicates there's no change in base rate until mid 2024 and then for falls to 2.75% uh, in December 25. I'd also point out that uh, as part of paragraph 25 <coughs> on page 27, um, that rich setting that rich setting opportunities. Um, you know, there's more opportunities for debt restructuring opportunities going forwards since the change in um, uh, yields across the month, across the, the yield code of one or borrowing. Uh, that's the key points of the report. Um, the remainder of the report looks at all the various credential indicators approved by full council, which we're currently complying with. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, Jonathan and then David. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a, a very quick question. In fact, I, I did have two questions, but you answered one of them in your uh, comprehensive presentation, so thank you for that. Um, we reviewed the um, Treasury Management Report relating to last year at um, the last audit committee meeting, and um, in that report, it said that the um, Expected borrowing over the next five years, so 23 to 28, um, under the medium term financial strategy was, um, I think, 608 million, but um, it's now 641. So I, I wondered if it was kind of a, a, an evolving document, if, um, if the plan was, um, was, was something that was rolling, or if, um, if there was any other reason for the increase. I would probably need to refer back to those reports to see why there was a, such a change. Um, no, normally, our bar requirement would only change when there's a change in um, uh, the plans used to finance the capital program. So unless anything changes on the capital program change, then I would only expect changes to happen if our plan delivery capital changes, which we find by borrowing. I can have a look at both those reports. Okay, thanks. That would be helpful. Thanks very much. 
Thank you. And um, yeah, if you could respond to that um, via Alison and we'll circulate that around the committee. Uh, David. <coughs> yes, thank you, Richard, for your report. Um, I know we've spoken about this be previously, but I still can't see any mention of a uh, loan from Bristol Beacon um, uh, to pay for the work on that. Is that going to be kicking in any time soon? Yeah, so this, this report primarily looks at our treasury investments, so um, any loans to third parties, which is for treasury personal cash service loans, and they form part of um, other budget reports. They're not included in this report. So this isn't, I, I don't know how the loan is actually phrased for the Bristol Beacon, but I thought we were paying for uh, a lot of the work, not actually giving the money straight to the Bristol Music Trust to spend. Yeah, I'm not, in terms of, um, there's no fiscal loan to Bristol Beacon uh, as part of our accounts at the moment. Does anybody know where that would appear, please? It's the funding of the capital programme, that's what we're referring to, and the Bristol Beacon line within our overarching capital programme. Uh, you won't see each, each project um, and the funding for each project separately identified. But when we get to the end of the year, you'll have the detailed breakdown of the complete financing of the capital programme. It's dealt with at the bottom line, etc. And then we can provide you the detail if you want to on any specific scheme. I look forward to that report, thank you. So, yeah, um, yeah, on um, page 12, the table on page 23. Um, could you remind me why there is the, such a big increase in the debt position from 446 to 526 within this year and the net borrowing position going up 146? And, and I think also the, um, most of the investments got a rate of return, but the mid year one, the 88, doesn't. Is that just it's missing? In terms of the rate, um, I can get that for you, it just must be missing, I'm not sure why that's happened, apologies for that. Uh, in terms of our net debt increasing, um, that's primarily because uh, we're funding the capital programme, so you know, we're, we're funded, we're, we haven't taken any borrowing at the moment, but we still are using our cash resources to fund the capital programme, and that's the primary, primary reason why our net debt is going up. It will also be to do with um, in previous years, we've actually financed our borrowing using our own cash, which is called internal borrowing. And as those reserves and balances fall, that means our net debt will increase as well. Patrick? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was noting uh, at the bottom of page 31, uh, it was saying we do expect we'll have sufficient funds to cover capital investment. Uh, Obviously, this is an ongoing situation, but I was wondering if any work has been done to update uh, or reaffirm this view in light of uh, last week's uh, evacuation and survey of Barton House. Uh, obviously, that's potentially a very expensive process. And I'm wondering if we've got any work ongoing to identify the impact that might have on these budgets. Uh, in terms of, I would imagine that would form part of the HRE business plan. So um, that should come back, come through as part of that budget process. Sure. Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to um, provide some clarity around the questions that were asked by Councillor Goodman and Councillor Wilcox. Um, in terms of Zoe's question about the, um, the rate of return not being shown in the table, it's actually 4.72%, which is shown just underneath the table, but it just so happens that it's missing from that particular cell um, in the table. And um, I think as far as um, Councillor Wilcox's question is concerned, the actual funding of the Bristol Beacon project is being met from existing cash surpluses, which is why the net debt is going up even though the gross debt isn't going up, it's because cash surpluses are, are, are reducing. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I have a couple of questions and comments um, of, uh, on this. One was um, 
with regards to the point on page 26 and, and bullet point 23, which talks about, um, oh, sorry, got that. it says um, about uh, rebroking the council's debt as time goes by, um, and it's just from an assurance point of view, an assurance that, you know, that um, that was being looked at before rates rose to the heights that they are, are at the moment and that you know opportunities just weren't there to um to rebook at the lower lower rate. Yeah. Uh, so in, in previous so so what we do on a treasury manager basis is look at how much cash you've got in hand. Um, and if we have significant levels of cash then you make a choice of whether to delay borrowing or take out borrowing at a time when it would actually cost the council. So that would have been a, if we've had interest rates where our investment is are significantly low compared to borrowing rates, it would make a judgment call whether it's cost effective for us to go out and borrow while there's a cost of carry to the council in terms of taking out that borrowing. Lovely, thank you. And um, on the capital program, uh, the, the, the table shows a fall in the level of capital receipts um, between the approved programme and the period six forecast. Um, what's the sort of headline ex explanation for that? So that's the table in then bullet point 31 on page 28. So in terms of the finance and the capital program, the capital, so and what, the HRA had a, had a larger program at the start of the year, and the capital receipts were used to finance a large end of their program. Their capital program has actually stalled, because it has reduced, and therefore the level of capital receipts needed to support that program is reduced. So therefore, we re analyzed the financing to support. And which is been used to finance the capital and move forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm looking to, I'm conscious of time today. <laughs> uh, David, one last point and then we'll move on. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hack, for your explanation. Uh, so I'd like to ask another question about uh, the table on uh, point 31 on page 28. So the funding for the Bristol Beacon would come out of which line there, capital grants? or one of the other lines of this. So I'm fully equipped to uh, deal with the report when it comes. Okay, sorry, is that, is that a question? Uh, it's an email. It would be... No, I wasn't asking you. <laughs> 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 so, so the Bristol Beacon is actually funded by multiple sources. So it's got grants. But uh, the LTM you're referring to would be borrowed. That's interesting because that figure's actually gone down and I would be expecting it to go up to pay for all the work on the Bristol Beacon. Yeah, because um, the way certain projects are financed by borrowing, uh, you know, if those schemes were delayed or paused, um, or if that would mean not as much borrowing as needed to support those schemes, it would be done on a collective basis. Well, I need more to read that. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll move on from this at the moment. We're asked to note the report, um, so I will consider noted. I'll also note that Councillor Hucker is obviously after an officer's job at some point. <laughs> okay, moving on, we've got the Q2 corporate risk report um, update from Hakim. Um, we were asked to review and comment on the report. We had hoped um, to have the risk owner of CRR 12 here today, um, which is the um, risk that deals with emergency responses. Um, unfortunately, they're still um, busy with the live um, incident. Um, so um, they are not going to be able to be here and answer any specific questions on that, but they will um, take um, written questions, so if you have got questions, um, we can channel them through Alison um, accordingly. Okay, 
Okay. Thank you. <coughs> this is the Q2 2023 24 corporate risks. Um, but we have one critical risk, 24 high risk, 4 medium. This is 23 relation 24. 5 improvement risks. Uh, two are to be deteriorated because it's S3 because they, we have external risk deteriorating as well. So and two escalator. I'm just going to start with the critical risk, which is on the children placed in unregistered provision, which is unlawful. Now, we've been working with the officers on this. Uh, there are mitigations in place. You will see at the in section, in section, section we only introduce a section where it's listing the number of new mitigations coming with section 3.13. Uh, for every high and critical risk, what we've done is to actually stay with the work with the officers and to look at what are the critical mitigations also controls that we should be placed to give assurance. Um, there are five improvement risks, for example, business continuity, uh, operational resilience, uh, possible financial framework and midterm financial plan, uh, capital portfolio, and then uh, financial sustainability of most risks. Again, we've been tracking feedback from the officers, looking at the actions that they that were suggested a few quarters ago, and uh, most of them have been implementing and they're giving us the chance that these risks are now improving. We have two deteriorating risks in Q2. Uh, that's the possible failure to deliver effective corporate health and safety. While we uh, begin engaging with the officers, there are new mitigations that have been assigned to look at this threat as well to at least keep an eye make sure that we are able to manage it. And this other one is CRM 12, which um, was highlighted to us, uh, but the officers could only get to them on the emergency plan and response. The external risk authority is the possible increase in winter flu because of COVID-19. This has been added just for precaution. Uh, generally, most people think COVID would not be as it's been in the last few years, but going towards winter, spike again in flu and so we thought we have to step up the controls and mitigations again just to track uh, the emergency there. Um, we have two escalating risks. The potential threat to other social care quality commission assurance preparedness and also the possible failure to improve compliance with procurement rules which result in particular breaches. These two, even though the current is there but we now escalated it because but it's important to give that visibility, but also there are controls in place and mitigations that we're tracking for these two interactive risks. Um, we've added a session which is an emerging risk. We need to look at what's coming up, horizon scanning, potentials, and uh, there's one currently which is reinforced autoclave, accreted concrete, which is RAC. It's an emerging strategy risk. Um, we, we've had plans to look at Council's portfolio generally so what's going on at the moment and I tend to bring that to the early committee for Q3 report as well. Section 3.12, we've identified 16 risks with static score. We now begin to challenge uh, threats that's been static for a long time with no movements, perhaps maybe last one year and looking at the quality of the internal controls or the mitigation plans just to make sure that if a particular risk is quite high, if they're high and we need to make sure that the action plan, the corresponding mitigations and action plan actually make commensurate enough to give assurance that we're doing something. And if we need to escalate for further decision, we have to. So we've informed all the officers that Q3 will need a level of assurance why those risks are still starting in the last one year. And so a lot of it, a lot of challenge, a lot of dive, deep dive going on, a lot of support for the officers going on. And um, we have 45 new mitigations from Q1 to Q2. That's the extent of the engagement we've had with the officers, just ensuring that we enforce areas where there are potential threats. Uh, and make sure that we have the stability on monitoring the mitigation plans as well. Also, just generally, we improve our system so that every DMT, every one can now see live in a dashboard uh, on time. The risks that are with you or coming to you, action plans are coming up with you, and we're happy to say 
that improvement will help to assist officers to early intervention of risks, not being on the um, missing any action plan, missing any controls. Thank you. Um, questions, as, as yeah. any members of the committee have up to questions with regards to David. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a question about CRR 25, the suitability of line of business systems. Um, its current risk assessment is 20, but the risk tolerance level is 10. But reading from the, the one pager on page 53, we're not going to be mitigating this risk until February 2028. Um, I'd be expecting to see some more progress on that earlier to try and fix that. I will take words and have feedback with the officers. I will spend time looking at this particularly as well, so we definitely need to report on security. Any other questions, members? Jonathan. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this is a stupid or obvious question, really, um, but I can't see um, an item specifically relating to the um, dedicated schools grant. Does that fall within CRR 13? CRR 13. So I think you have a question. Um, yeah, the dedicated schools grant obviously has a, um, a risk, um, a serious risk around that, as there's a deficit on it. Um, does that, is that risk identified within CRR 13, only I can actually see a, a, a separate item on the risk register for it? I can actually answer that, okay, so we have um, some of our risk are overarching risk of which there are subsets um, that are in each of the services. The financial risk in year deficit is one that suits us and so it covers the entire council and any potential risk of in year deficits. And the financial framework and medium term financial plan will also cover the DSG uh, as well because that's over the medium term. It will cover social care and all of those key risks. And within each of their specific service risk registers, they'll have a detailed plan in relation to their service risk and how that's been managed. Thank you very much. Any other questions? If not, I had a couple. <laughs> um, so I've I, I, I got a couple on the CRR 12 risk that we were hoping to explore today, which I'll forward on um, to, to the head of service via Alison, and I'll ask other committee members to do the same. If they can copy me in when they're emailing Alison, we thought that'd be great. Um, I had a couple of queries. Um, one was, uh, and again, this might be, you might have to take this away and you know, yeah. come back. CRR 27, um, the failure to, uh, the, the, the risk of failing to deliver the capital transport programme. It's got mitigation actions, um, which were due in September, which have had zero progress to date, um, according, to the, according to the summary. Um, so I was wondering if we could maybe have an update on, on, on where that's at. Um, and I guess, um, and again this will probably tie in with, um, to some extent with the queries that we had on CRR 12 with regards to emergency planning, but on CRR 52 um, there is a that's the risk that there's a possible failure to ensure high-rise properties meet safety regulations in the Building Safety Act. Um, and I wonder if that's, you know, if, if, if the risks that have been, out, that will be identified following the incident in Barton House, well, that's going to feed into A, the assessment of that risk, and B, uh, the mitigating measures um, that, that are required. So those were, um, my main questions I have of the report, but if there are no other <coughs> questions from the committee, um, we are asked to refuse. Oh, sorry, oh, 
now, now I've got forest of hands. Again, I am conscious of time and I will keep things moving, but sorry, Patrick, I've seen your hands now. Yeah, thanks. Um, on the summary table, I was getting a bit confused, and I think it's to do with the placement of the, the little mini grids with the dots and them are wrong. Um, could you just go back and make sure they're correct for the next one? Um, so, like, 21s or something. I was just looking at it, like, that risk has gone down a lot, and actually it's just the, the little 4x4 four four grids being wrong. That's so, okay. Um, maybe leave that as a statement if you want, to, unless you want to respond specifically. I need clarification, please. I just want to. Which one? Is it the table um, presentation? There's quite a few. I can show you where to find them. Okay. If you look, you can see. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and Patrick. In the interest of time, I can make a written question if that's preferable. Um. I think it might be actually. <laughs> Um, if you can submit it to Alex and copy me in, and when when the when the um, answers come through, we'll circulate them to the full committee so that everybody can can have sight of those as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, in that case, we've reviewed and commented on that, and we'll move on to item eleven, which is internal audit half year report. Let's turn back. Thank you, Chair. These are a report that gives an update from April to October. This also includes some of the work that we've already told you about. Just in short, uh, we have certified 36 grants uh, worth 31 million. There's work that's ongoing in terms of implementation of uh, audit deductions. The report is very clear in terms of uh, the need to sustain the current um, trajectory given where we were. Uh, I also want to mention the fact that uh, our partnership agreement with KPMG is expiring uh, in January, so we're in the process of uh, looking for another strategic partner. The appendix one will, will indicate all the work that has been completed and outcomes. Uh, it also indicates any work that is work, still work in progress. You notice that within that schedule there's any, this reflects to be not applicable. These are instances where we have not provided any opinion because it relates to better assurance where we are working with uh, the with management to support them on the projects. Chair of Topia and take any question in terms of that appendix before we move to appendix two. Okay. Um, members, do you have any specific questions on on Simba's part of the report before we move on to the limited assurance paper? transition of young people in care between children and adult services. Colleagues in those services were already aware that there were issues with that transition journey and had already commissioned a project to address those acknowledged issues. Uh, we carried out a review, provided limited assurance. Uh, the findings of that review would be taken into account the project to address that is now underway and we are uh, attending the project board to provide a oversight. The respective directors of the two services are present to answer any questions which the committee may have, so I will hand over to those colleagues now. Afternoon. Um, I'm Fiona Tice, Director of Children and uh, Families, um, and I'll just make a few comments and then hand over to Meta, Director of um, Adults. Um, so really it was just to kind of um, bring together kind of the summary of the, the report, um, and what we kind of felt was that the report was kind of grouped into two main themes, the, the data and the insight and the protocols and processes around that work. Um, and together they were impacting and do impact on the support for the young people and families um, receive at this kind of significant point in their lives. Um, so we've taken both kind of strategic and tactical actions to address those. Um, as Phil says, we have now got a transitions project um, launched early this year. It's got a dedicated project team um, and I sponsor that and um, 
there are regular meetings to um, address and make progress against this. Um, we have made some progress. The report kind of highlights some of that. We've looked um, at more data analysts and recording and we've completed 80% now of our, of our audits by young people of 13 years and above who um, may present to our, our colleagues in adult social care. Um, and we've also done quite a significant piece of work looking um, at other local authorities and benchmarking how other local authorities have managed this area of work. Um, we want to make sure that we get this right and we use best kind of practice and research and evidence from other local authorities. That's been quite a comprehensive piece of work. Um, and our, at our last meeting, we reported back on some of the, the positives and um, in other local authorities, not something that we could kind of lift and shift into Bristol, but really kind of looking at the elements um, in other local authorities that would make sense to Bristol and improve our practice. Hello, so yes, I'm Lydia Anderson, Director of Adult Social Care. Um, we felt that there was a need to take some uh, immediate actions in response to the um, internal audit. So these are just some of the things that we did uh, over the summer. So you will probably have seen from the report that the team was operating in two halves, one for under 18s and one for over 18s. One of the first actions that we took was actually to join those two together um, in order to make better use of the resources that we have. Um, and through that, we've been able to very significantly reduce the waiting list. Um, we also had a real push on recruitment and actually achieved full recruitment over the summer. Unfortunately, since then, two people have moved on, so we are still recruiting, um, but um, we did uh, show that we were able to, to do so. Um, the final thing was uh, to introduce some additional resources into the team. So one of the things that we had some concerns about was oversight in the team with the capacity that they had. Uh, to manage their volume of work, so we've introduced an additional team manager in order to strengthen the size of the service. So that was just to share with you some of the immediate actions that were taken um, uh, on receiving the internal audit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members, does anyone have a question for David and then John? Yes, thank you for your report. Um, one uh, comment about the way that the report is presented first before I lead into my questions. Um, on section 1.5, you talk about four high priority and five medium uh, findings, and then you leap into them. It would be really good to actually separate them out as high and medium priority so that there's no ambiguity about what you think are high and medium ones. So if that could be uh, retrospectively done in the report, that would be useful. Um, my first question is, um, the first point of that, paragraph 1.5, uh, talks about internal audit were able to conf unable to confirm that all young people requiring transition support have been identified and were preparing for transition. <coughs> Do we have any idea of the scale of the number of people who fell through the cracks, please? I would add to that that one of the things that the project needs to identify is actually scope 
I've been on the Code People's Service. Um, when the service was set up, it was set up to support newly disabled children who were coming through the Disabled Children's Service. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the questions that we have ourselves in terms of the numbers of young people who might transition is what the scope of that service is and the, and the, the crimes of young people that they support. Thank you. Um, it really is our job to get bogged down in the figures, that's why we're here. Yes. So I really would like a figures, some figures about how many children actually didn't get picked up, please. As of today, I can't tell you the answer to that question. Could, could we have a written reply, please? We will go away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, John? Uh, sorry, not Jonathan. John. <laughs> Thank you for the report. Um, I have residents that have fallen through the cracks in, in this area um, and one of the messages from them really was around communication. Is that something that you've been looking at? Because I think one of the, the one of the complaints was they, they, they fell through the cracks and it was kind of the 16th birthday and then they were in limbo. So I'm assuming you're looking at these a lot earlier. but. If you're looking at the communication aspect, it can kind of help pick up some of those cases before they fall through the cracks. So I just wanted to, some sort of assurance that the communication with parents, for example, was being looked at. I think inherent in the planning, what we're trying to achieve is that we identify young people from the age of 14. Um, and if we do so, and we have them in our sites the whole time, that communication should fall well out of that because we'll know exactly who they are and we'll know where to step in. And some and some of that is linked to the kind of management oversight and the supervision, so ensure that we are aware of the children and that appropriate workers have appropriate supervision and obviously be able to feed back to the parents. Any more questions from members? Simon. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, first is for Simba though, I think. Um, for, in terms of our assurance, it says progress. Uh, in italics, is that internal audit's view of progress or is that management's view of progress? It's a, on a joint view of progress in terms of there were management responses in the initial report which formed then the first draft of the summary, however the colleagues have updated those to give the most recent view of progress since the uh, report was published, so they produced that. We have a quick look at it to see that it matches our understanding, but we haven't as yet got a re-audit to confirm yeah, the detailed progress. And so could I just ask when we're likely to receive that re-audit? So I think so. Every limited assurance will do a review after six months just to give management the opportunity to put action in place and to impede the arrangements. And if I could just add that partly depends on the due dates that are in the report and are agreed in that we want to give management an appropriate time to be able to put things in place. Yes, we want to encourage prompt action, but we have to be realistic when there is a lot to do. No, I fully appreciate that, but my question is when will we get it? On, on that basis. So the protocol is that um, we'll do this review probably in Q1 from next year and then you get the outcome to following uh, the following audit commit. If it is limited again, then you get the full report, but if it is not, you get just confirmation that uh, things are now okay. And in the meantime, I'm sitting on the project board that is overseeing the project, so I'll be able to keep an eye on progress uh, and the simple says we'll do full follow-up in the first part of next year. Thank you. Um, I had a um, comment and a question. First of all, you know, clearly this has been a major issue, but as you're told, so you can see from the report, there's been a number, you know, quite a number of steps in place, you know, already taken to seek to rectify that, which is obviously positive. So, you know, again, like like other members, I'll look forward to. And uh, you know, seeing the results of the re audit, and hopefully not, um, you know, having another session like this one. Um, I don't know quite how to phrase this question. It, 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 
it's ultimately it was ultimately the issue that um, those people who were transitioning between the two services um, was ultimately the issue that there wasn't necessarily the one person or the one role overseeing who, whose overall responsibility for those people and is that something that has been addressed i.e. Um, you know is it, 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 you know it's one of the services uh, taking overall responsibility for that transition I would say as the report sets out there wasn't just one main contributory reason I think there were multiple reasons um, which was both about management oversight um, and about data and our insights um, and our ability to identify but it was also that systemically it was quite fractured because it's a, it's a building turn out lots of so that fracturing is probably um, where most of the, the, the root causes are sitting so for myself and Fiona the reason why we were together today it is really to show our, our commitment to making sure that that fracturing ceases and we have comprehensive initiatives okay thank you David, one last question. I'm getting con really conscious of time today. <laughs> one last question. Uh, I note that you're transferring to a Power BI dashboard in the mm -hmm. not too distant future. Can members have access to this um, Power BI dashboard, please, so that we can get a feel for how things are working? I think, it's a I think it's a difficult one, I think, uh, Councilla like Oaks, but I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll take the action and I'll come back to you on that. I just want to be comfortable that uh, whatever is being shared, I think, is appropriate, so I'll take the point and come back to you on that. I probably just want to caveat it wouldn't be standard to, for members to have access to a Power BI dashboard that has lots of detailed information and confidential information, so... I wouldn't anticipate that that be an acceptable approach, but I'll let Simba look into it before we come back. Thanks, Denise. Um, if, if there could be a high level version, <laughs> that could be useful, but I'll leave that, I'll leave that where it is. Um, just on, just the final thing on this report, um, I was going to um, forward that on to the Chair of People's Scrutiny, who is uh, sat just over um, just over there um, for just for their information um, as well um, and I am going to um, move on to well we're asked to note the report um, and also note the internal audit summary um, and take assurance from management and if there's no further comments we really move on to the counter fraud report Um, so, some of the key messages from our half year fraud report are that we have achieved 34 outcomes from our tenancy fraud work, and that is responsible for the bulk of the notional £4 million savings. We've identified recoverable savings of £560,000, and we are increasing our focus on fraud prevention work and are implementing a fraud prevention plan strategy. The bulk of our proactive fraud work in the first half of the year has been around the National Fraud Initiative data. We received over 14,000 matches. Work on that today has saved um, some £221,000. We undertook a blue badge enforcement event in the city centre back in September. Um, we had three ongoing cases in respect of suspected misuse of blue badges. I think it's important to note that we always get a lot of public support for those events, in particular from blue badge holders. We've worked closely with colleagues reviewing guardianship payments, um, the crowd acts have checked for them, and we've also worked with them on reviewing their controls and documentation with a view, with a view to preventing fraud. We're working with services across the council uh, as part of the fraud prevention plan to develop fraud risk assessments, the aim being that every service will have a fraud risk assessment in place. So we've been doing a lot of work to educate and support managers and providing some online guidance and tools 
for them to use. We've been delivering fraud awareness training and fraud awareness messages and that will continue over the second half of the year. Um, notably, we've had increased engagement with schools this year, which has been really positive. And we will continue to, to develop the fraud hub. We're always looking for new data sets, both, to, both internal and external. Um, keep trying to work with neighbouring local authorities and registered housing providers on, on that. Um, and we'll be continuing work on the fraud risk assessments as part of the fraud prevention strategy. Thank you, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, any questions from members? Just a really quick one. With regards to things like blue badges, um, from a fraud point of view, I'd imagine the biggest element is somebody using a badge that isn't theirs. Would you, do you look at things like having photographic ID on there, like you with a taxi license, for example? There is a photograph of the badge holder on the, ba on the badge. David? Yeah, I mean, going through this report, it does seem to be an awful lot of sort of potentially small ticket stuff, what are we doing about this before where people, you know, you know, larger works, you know, costing several million pounds and how are we making sure that we're not being defrauded in those larger So I did sorry this part of that. Type of fraud. Yeah, it just seems to be sort of sort of small things like, you know, somebody's, you know, using a blue badge incorrectly and stuff like that and it's using one. How about sort of the larger fraud risk areas where we could potentially be done out of millions? So we are doing some work um, in the area of procurement fraud. Um, that's not my area, so I don't know whether Simba will have more information about that. Um, the other area we want to do more is, is direct payments because that's um, lots of money. Um, we're working with the Cabinet Office on ways to use the data on that at the moment. Um, but yes, Simba, do you want to pick up about the Yes, so, so I think the, the difficulty with some of those big things that you're talking about, you always receive, I think, some concerns, but some of it just comes to collusion and it's very, very difficult to prove. So, yes, that's what that's happening, and I think the staff that um, colleagues in procurement and us are working on trying to see whether they, we can use some of those uh, fraud red flags on procurement, but that area is very, very difficult to find that a lot of people publish that there's a lot of procurement fraud, but there are very, very, very few instances where that is actually proven because it's very, very difficult to prove. But we are alive to that, that risk is very, it's there, and we try to do as much as we can to make sure that that's mitigated. So the key issue, I think, is not about investigating, it's about preventing so that that risk doesn't yeah, materialize. Because once it has materialized, it's very, very difficult to prove. So the work that's been done is around prevention. Just one quick comeback on that, I'm going to check. Um, are we, do we have a process in place of making sure that what we check that work has been done before we send to pay the bill? Because otherwise you get people, I'm just saying this in my own sort of public sector role before the awareness training that I've had to do. You know, it's very easy for someone to inflate a bill or charge for something that hasn't been done unless we actually go and check. You know, that the repairs have been carried out, or this or that. Unless you check it's been done before we pay, then you could be paying and haven't done the work, they've just taken the money. So, so some of these things that have to be managed through contract management, because I think the service which has commissioned that work are responsible for making sure that they are paying for what they've uh, commissioned. So yes, they are, that's why one working set to make sure that we have sufficient controls to make sure that we are paying for what we've commissioned. But it has to be, I think it has to be part of prevention, not part of not the end process where you're looking for or to recover money. But yes, the controls are around that are the most important ones to look at. But it has to be done through a product management. So, the, so those are people involved in contract management trained in dealing with fraud and have to be aware of fraud? Um, yeah, I can answer that. So we've got quite a robust training programme for all officers who commission services or um, our contract managers, and that includes fraud prevention, paying, 
timely out invoices once work is complete. Um, so it's quite a, a robust training that all council officers responsible for those areas have to undertake as manager. Okay, thank you um, for that. If there's no other comments on the counter fraud report, then we shall um, note it and move on. I do note that we have now been joined by a couple of members of Resources Scrutiny. Um, I'm afraid uh, we're not quite um, at the agenda item yet. I'm trying to canter through this as quickly as possible, but um, it's it's um, we're, we're not quite there. Um, the next item though should be quite quick to get through um, it's the audit committee's half year report to full council 23-24 and um, i've had input into this um, and i'm going to ask um, that uh, a, a further clause is added just to uh, thank tony uh, councillor tony dyer for his work as vice chair because uh, obviously by the time it comes to full council he won't well, it's already no longer vice chair, really. Um, so, um, so, 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 other than that, um, are there any brief comments? If not, um, I shall ask. I shall consider it approved, and we can move on to the next item. Oh, lovely. Um, the and that's, uh, the next item on the agenda is the Internal Water Quality Assurance Improvement Program and the. Um, and then the internal audit plan for 23 24 accused four priorities. Um, Simba has kindly offered to um, move those down to the bottom of the agenda, which will give us an opportunity to look at the DSG. Um, oh no, we've got the procurement and compliance update. So if we can have the com procurement compliance update, and then we'll move on to um, the items on the DSG deficit reduction programme, and we'll come back to those um, audit items um, later on. Uh, can I just remind you that one of the DSGRs is the exempt item, so you're going to populate exempt operations? Yes, that's fine. I think um, given that we've got members here from resources, that we can, you know, it'll give us an opportunity to move on to that as quickly as possible, and then um, that frees up the rest of the afternoon. But if you can go into the procurement compliance update, um, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, I'm Matt King, uh, Governance and Performance Manager within the Procurement and Contract Management Service. Uh, so, um, uh, the reports uh, that I've presented um, set down the current position as regards uh, non compliance with the Council's internal procurement rules, uh, which is broadly that there is lower non compliance than last financial year, uh, but the numbers are still high. Uh, the report sets out the management actions that have been undertaken uh, or are already complete. Uh, I would highlight that a number of the key actions underway involve changes to working practices, uh, and in those instances, progress uh, on those items may take time to filter through into lower non compliance numbers. Uh, so, the report provides an update on non compliance with the Open Council Day Procurement Rules, as well as assurance regarding actions being taken by the Council to improve compliance levels. Uh, and uh, just to also note that data on non compliance will be provided as, as part of the end of year report for the committee uh, next time more. Uh, so, uh, thank you and happy to take your question. Okay, uh, Jonathan. Thank you. Just a, a very quick question. Uh, the report states that there were 342 breaches in uh, financial year 22 23. 125 in Q2 23-24. I assume that figure of 125 is a cumulative figure. It is, yes. Yeah, sorry, I noticed that. Sorry, apologies. It's uh, it's yes, Q1 and Q2 yeah. together. Okay, thanks. Okay, are there any other questions, comments from members? No. Okay, well, um, we are asked to note the data on the procurement features and action underway to improve the, uh, procurement compliance. So we shall consider that noted. Um, and then if we move to. Um, do we have all the members of resources who we anticipated would be here? Okay. 
Um, if, if members of the committee and um, people uh, scrutiny are um, happy to, we shall skip the comfort break and move straight on to the DSG Deficit Reduction Programme, uh, the public um, paper that's, that we've got in front of us. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I'm Gary May, uh, and so we're here to talk you through uh, the DSG deficit program, uh, the reduction program. Uh, so you should have received the papers. You should have received the papers um, outlining where we are, what we're trying to do. Just leave it in the first one. Okay. Hey. Hello. 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 Thank you. Um, so, so obviously, in recent years, uh, the increase in demand um, for um, education and health care plans has placed significant pressure um, on where we are in terms of the high needs block funding. Uh, this has resulted in a significant deficit in the high needs block funding, uh, which it continues to increase and is likely to increase to 58, around £58 million pounds this year. Um, any local authority that has a deficit in its uh, DSG position needs to put forward a, um, a mitigation plan to try and address some of those and work with the DFE to ensure that that meets, uh, it, it gets under control. So Bristol, um, as part of its mitigation plan, put forward 14 specific pieces of work last year which were signed off by Schools Forum. Um, they're outlined in uh, section 3.4 of the report uh, as a brief overview. Um, some of those um, projects and programs are being taken forward as part of business as usual. Some of them are also standalone projects that are funded by uh, Department for Education's uh, Delivering Better Value in SEND program. Um, four of these pieces of work that were in the mitigation plans uh, from last September have been taken forward as part of the Delivering Better Value with SEND programme. Uh, specifically, the review of the High Needs Block Element 3 non statutory top up funding, uh, specialist place planning, uh, review of the 18 to 25 EHCP top up, uh, sorry, Education, Health and Care Plan top up funding, and the review of post 16 out of authority funding. Um, we are currently, uh, we, to do this work, we, paired, um, we uh, procured a delivery partner, Social Finance and People Public Private Limited, um, who are delivering that work stream for us. It's currently out to consultation. There are a number of consultation events happening over the next two to three weeks before that consultation closes on the 13th of um, December with a decision due at Cabinet in the early, uh, the early new year. Um, so in terms of where we are, in terms of our unmitigated forecasts around this, so as part of our Delivering Better Value with SEND programme, uh, we worked with a, um, a partner of the Department for Education, Newton Europe, who did a deep dive analysis of our uh, projected um, overspend in the depths in the um, in the DSG, and as you can see uh, in section 5.2, uh, the unmitigated position at the end of 27-28 is expected to reach over 120 million pounds. Um, in section 5.5, the mitigations are broken down into what the proposed savings are in each of those work streams and projects uh, to hopefully bring us to a point where we're starting to see a reduction in that deficit over the next five to six years. To oversee the delivery of that work, um, there's a programme team made up of myself and project, project officers and project managers as well as Gary, who's been brought in as a, the uh, strategic programme lead in this space. We're working with colleagues across the local authority 
um, and the education uh, system to try and turn the tide on that deficit. Um, and we have developed a governance structure which is outlined in section 5.10, uh, which sets out um, how we're going to work with partners or how we are working with partners across the SEN system, including health partners, schools, and how this aligns to the governance framework of the City Council. Um, and I think that's a general overview of where we are in terms of the DSG project. Okay, thank you. Um, members, and um, at this point I should formally welcome um, Councillor Scholar, Fodder, Hopkins and um, Townsend um, who are joining us for this, for this section. Um, are there any questions, bearing in mind that what we're looking at here is the public paper and this is a public session? Councillor Gollum? I can start with just a very simple question, but as a committee is charged with governance um, and, and monitoring governance, I'd just like to question the comment that this is scheduled to go to Cabinet, because it doesn't, uh, does it appear in the current medium term, uh, in the Mayor's forward plan? I don't see it listed, I may have missed it, but I, I, I think this is a classic example of where these items need to be scheduled as to when they're coming so that members of council and members of the public can be aware of it. I'm happy to be corrected and have it pointed out to me where it is, but on a quick glance I've missed it. Um, I believe it has already been taken through to Cabinet um, earlier in the year, um, so we may need to go back and double check, but something was presented to Cabinet, I don't know if you're aware. Yeah. It went through to schools for in March, and I think the DMP DDE program was reported to cabinet subsequent to that. But I'll wait to colleagues to confirm. Yeah. So, so an overview of the DSG program went to uh, cabinet in October of this year uh, for noting. Uh, there was no decision required, and it was outlining uh, the mitigation plans and uh, elements of the programme, as Denise has said, went to uh, Cabinet previously, including the delivering better value in SEND uh, for a decision to support the um, £1 million grant funding from the DfE. The, um, the, um, the four elements of the uh, consultation are currently out, the four projects that are part of Workstream 2 of delivering better value in SEND, will be coming to Cabinet in uh, the early new year and will be part of the forward, published as part of the forward plan uh, in December. That was, that was my point, Chair. That it's not in the forward plan and there is nothing mandatory that says that items should only be put on the forward plan 30 days before they're brought to Cabinet. And that's where I think the problem lies with issues of this significance. It's a point I'll meet, um, and I know you've, you and others have made it in various forum um, and this council. And, um, yeah, um, it would be good to see these things on the forward plan well in advance so you'll know what's coming down the track. Um, Councillor Townsend, you indicated. Well, it's just in response really to Councillor Gollop. There's, um, there's an annual cycle of things that need to go to Cabinet for this brief fence budget. So I don't know why there is, there is no reason why it can't be on the, on an annual basis because they come every year at the same time uh, because they have to set budget. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Wilcox, you indicated. Yes, um, I have a question about the actual papers themselves. On page 172, uh, we talk about creating an additional 450 specialist provision places by 2024. How many existing specialist provision places are there so that we can get a scale of how much we're actually increasing the number of specialist provision places by, please? We, we don't, uh, currently we're around 400 places short in terms of meeting NREHCP requirements. The 
current ramp that we've got going through um, due to come online still leaves us short. Um, so what we're currently doing, and this is a uh, this is a, about really where we're at. Um, we need to understand more about what our sufficiency requirements are. So we have certain provisions being made. We're not clear at the moment whether that provision is the right provision. Um, we know that we'll utilise the spaces, but we suspect that against primary need, um, we will um, require additional spaces and additional primary needs. So most of that is targeted at our uh, children with social, emotional, mental health issues. Um, but we, we've got a, an increasing demand on autism, as you, you're probably aware. Um, and we mustn't forget the other, uh, the other seven areas of that primary as well. But there hasn't previously been any sufficiency planning, so we're picking that up now as, as a way forward. It's a priority for, our, for us because we want to make sure that the plans that we're putting in place are going to meet need but we're not going to overbuild as well. We don't want to have um, spaces that we can't fill because that's also a cost to us. So, sorry to get bogged down in the numbers again, because we're here again. Um, you've not said how many places you've actually got, and I can understand there's a broad spectrum of places where you will have so many for autism, so many for a different need, but you must have a total figure of how many set the places you do have at the moment, please. Yeah, we do. I don't have them in front of me. I can only give you the ballpark figures. We, we can get you that information. I don't have that information. I think that's a useful way to this discussion. Can I respond, Andrew Wilcox? If you don't have all of the team here, we'll be able to provide the answers to some of those questions. Our colleagues have stepped in in the last minute to be able to fill the gap because you don't have your director of education. She's on well able to attend, you don't have your capital team and you don't have your accountants, so some of the information they're going to need to take back and then respond, but we do have details in terms of how many places we currently have. I think the point that Gary was making is that actually the provision being uh, being rolled out at the moment would only adjust for many short of meeting our current gap, but we also have to think of the forecasted gap for the future as well, so that's some of the work that colleagues have been doing. Is looking at the forecast trajectory for the next 10 to 15 years and trying to work through the demand and need and actually also ensure that there's going to be sufficiency of provision for planning forward as well as dealing with our current challenges and our current backlog. But they can come back with more details to give you specifics in terms of how much we currently have. It's very clear that the amount being rolled out is not going to meet our forecasted needs if we're going to change behaviours and start to think differently about in authority provision and having some provision of our own so that we don't need to use independent, uh, you know, um, non maintained schools out of authority. So there's a need to create provision so that we can actually do that transition as well. So all of that is coming through in some of the modelling that's taking place at the moment. And that's the area of saying that's still work in progress and not fully complete. Uh, so I think it's all of those different metrics coming together, but you'll need to have other colleagues here to be able to explain some of that, but we're happy to share that with you and maybe just provide you with a written response to some of that. Um, sorry, David, just before you come in, I'll just stop for my apologies here because I should have made clear that the director was unable to be here and wanted to take written. I think I, um, I had emailed audit members to, to notify them of that, but um, the, other, the other members here won't have been aware that unfortunately the director is unable to attend today. So, uh, but written questions can be taken away and we can get to answers. Um, David, sorry, can I come back? I think that would be really useful in this discussion. Yes, thank you, Chair. John. Yeah, can I just piggyback on the back of that point, really? Because I get that the, this is all about the, the lack of provision at the moment and the, obviously really importantly forward provisioning but from our point of view when we're seeking assurance those numbers of what we're lacking at the moment and what we may be lacking in the future are all in the context of the provision we currently have and so without that number of what we currently have it's just hard for us as, as laymen to put into context what we're talking about you know we could have 10 cases at the moment and 400 a massive gap or we could have 3,000 you know 400 is a smaller so it's just for us to get the context. We, we have um, over 200 
pupils with the HCPs in our independent or maintained schools, um, they are high cost. Um, all of our special places are taken up. Um, we have um, 193 pupils that have an EHCP that are waiting for a place. So what we're looking at is in the short term how we can address that and part of that is how we address um, looking at our alternative learning provision and building the quality of that um, and the number of places. Um, our alternative learning provision is changing its model so it's going to be more early, early, early intervention and clearly part of our plan has got to be to ensure that we can maintain children in mainstream school where that's the best outcome for them um, without them having a plan because the cost is plans. Um, we, want, we, we must make sure that we provide plans for those children that need them, um, but we've also got to make sure we've got the right type of provision in place. So developing um, our current our providers to increase our capacity is one of our key strategies. Um, early intervention by that, by the out team, so the alternative learning team, is about enabling schools to identify early and put in preventative measures which will support children in school, in mainstream school, rather than needing a plan. Uh, we've also got a range of work streams that are working on um, looking at um, support that um, children need and their families need at that support level. Um, so we've got four different pathways, looking at those pathways to independence, which is core um, in the requirement on, on SEM in children. Um, with Early years, of course, is one of the key areas where we can do prevention and early intervention. And you know, there's a simple example of that is that with early um, speech and language therapy support to children, we can prevent, for a large proportion, those children ending up with behavioural issues in mainstream school where mainstream can no longer um, cope. And that potentially then would increase our EHCP, but with early intervention and prevention with families and children, we can support that. Uh, we have support for SEN children within uh, primary and secondary school um, and that's about teaching first and quality teaching through our graduated response. What we're looking at is actually how we can support the family to support the child more. And I, you know, my, my example for this is when you've got your own children, primary school sends reading books home and you sit there and you read with your, your child and that helps them to progress. Some of the demands that are around children that need additional support in, in mainstream schools is higher than that. We need to give the support to parents and siblings to enable the success of that support rather than the schools picking that they've only, only got one opportunity, which is to refer children for a higher level of, of support. Um, so I think we've, we're looking at, this is not a one fit. There's lots of things that we need to put right and we're identifying what those things are and sufficiency and making sure we have the right type of provision to reduce our dependency on our independent non maintained schools is one of our ways that we will um, get to a, a balanced budget. You, you make a really good point and um, about the early intervention and the early identification. Um, I have a child that's been waiting a year and a half for an autism test. So do, do the council also work to improve the rate at which you can identify the children that need the special educational needs provision because obviously at the moment I guess you're just working with the number of identified cases there are lots of people also in the system waiting to be identified as well. Yeah and there, there are some uh, parents who haven't identified and um, so we're working with that closely with their health colleagues so this is about how health visitors contribute to this and our work stream that works on that early years contains our early years providers, it contains health visitors, it contains um, speech and language therapists, occupational therapists, a whole range of people that will help us to identify what provision we've got, what provision we need, but more importantly how to access that. And you're right, we have a local offer uh, which um, certainly needs, needs developing and improving, um, but mostly people only understand about the local offer when they're in the system. It's when you don't know where you are that you don't have access to that. And that's what this early intervention is about. It's about creating, I want, you know, what's called the yellow brick road that identifies where you are on that and what sort of services you can access. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Councillor Ford, I'll indicate, um, and then if there's a, oh, no, it's okay. Um, Councillor Ford first, and then I'll come to Councillor Gollum and Councillor Hopkins. 
Yeah, thank, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, this, I mean, the, the, the discussion that's just, just gone shows that it is very complex and it's got so many different sort of layers and, and levels. And the, the, the work stream too, which is about work with stakeholders and having that sort of understood better, to me it is crucial because relationships are broken down, um, there are different types, the, the parents are stakeholders, the ones not in the system, who don't feel the system is letting them in, uh, and where their schools haven't recognised them or supported them, the schools have to be effective parts of the system, including the mainstream schools, but where the capacity has been lacking, um, obviously the providers and, and the specialists and so on. Um, the, the governance of that and the, just the management of relationships with stakeholders is crucial. How's, how's that being handled? Because I, I see that in February that, that part is meant to be signed off, obviously, in, in the Cabinet, in terms of that part of the work stream. Will it, will it be in place for that? So, so DBB. Uh, Workstream 2 that you referred to are those four elements that yeah, how we use top up funding. So that's the piece of work that we brought in a delivery partner to do using uh, DFE grant funding. Um, that piece of work is um, the, the, the work that went behind that was lots of engagement with uh, schools, with professionals in the SEND system, um, with um, colleagues across local authority as well who work in SEND. Um, and looking at best practice from other local authorities nationally to, to hopefully bring Bristol into line with the best practice nationally around this. Uh, as I say, the consultation is currently live. We've shared that widely. Um, there are um, focus groups um, scheduled with parent carers, children, young people, uh, school professionals, and um, again, uh, colleagues across the local authority to try and uh, support the development of that piece of work. It is scheduled to come to Cabinet in the early new year for a key decision on how we uh, use that top of funding going forward. Um, I, I don't see why we wouldn't come to Cabinet in the early new year for that. Uh, thanks, Rick. Can, can we be confident that, that the work with the parents, the work with the mainstream schools and others will have, will have been able to be delivered? But not just the consultation, but then and be confident that the remedial sort of processes, because they're, they're quite sensitive, really, and they also require capacity in schools and so on. Yeah, with that, we, we work with um, our Parent Carers Forum on a regular basis. They're engaged with all of the projects that we, we run from here, so we're always conscious, but I mean, that, that's a balance, because they are a finite group, <laughs> and we, we want to make sure that we're utilising them in the best possible way. Um, we, the, some of our other projects are looking at how schools and parents work together, so we're supporting those through a few test and learn projects where we're learning actually what works. Um, and, and we've got an event that will be uh, coming up, um, I think, around March time, where we'll start to share some of that learning. The problem with the test and learn is, of course, it's only with a small number of schools. Um, and we, we don't have the facility to roll out some of the programmes that are providing us with some valuable information. We're dependent on the schools probably taking on that responsibility. Um, but one of our key areas um, is around inclusion and how we, you know, how we get partners to work together and, and be inclusive. So we particularly need our primary and secondary schools to be inclusive and have that, that level of approach. So we're hoping that what we learn will influence schools. We can't tell schools what to do. You know, that they they, they um, have to work that out with us, hopefully. But it is about um, a cultural change, I think, to some extent, that this is a problem. We do have a problem and we've got to work together to solve it. It isn't just Bristol City Councils. This is a, a complex, wide-reaching um, part of our society. And we're working with you know, those, those children that are our most vulnerable and have least life choices. So we, we're working hard to try and make sure that we're bringing people together to help get the best solutions. Thank you. Um, I've got Councillor Gollum, then Councillor Hopkins, and then if, oh, Councillor Townsend again, and then I'll maybe look to draw the public, um, you know, the examination or, or the, then the questions on the public paper to a close. Uh, Councillor Gollum. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I have no idea what's in the confidential papers, so it may be that 
what I'm about to ask would have been answered if I'd been able to see them. I presume members of all the committee have seen the confidential papers. Yes. Um, sorry, an advice that they should have been sent to you, but we can't say something. Yes, I think the councillors went up, but I sent you the appointment to attend this session. I sent you the papers and the attached appointment, so the exempt appendix is there. That would be that would be helpful, but I'm not used to that happening, so it did not occur to me to look into look at that. Um, so it may be what I'm about to say is it, it will be made redundant by that. Um, but just hearing the comments made by by members of the audit committee. I find looking at this report, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's positive. It tells lots of good things that we're aiming to do. But it doesn't put my mind at rest as to how we are turning the corner. It tells a story that I want to hear and an outcome I want to see. But I, yeah, you, uh, Councillor Dieter mentioned the, the question about the, the HCPs that, that are there. Um, and we don't, we have no idea from this report what the backlog is now, but I know for the past few years the backlog's increased each year. So actually that's been people where we don't even know what level of support they need because we haven't got them in the system. So we have a report that tells us how we're going to increase more places. That's good, but it tells us we're going to do it and reduce costs. And if it was that easy to reduce the costs, I feel we should be asking the question, why haven't we done it before? But I suspect the answer is because it's not that easy to reduce the costs. In which case, what are the implications if we don't succeed in doing so? Um, and I can't get any measure of the sense of risk of what the contingent risk, contingent liabilities are on the authority. Now that may be in the confidential papers, but it seems to me we are in danger of a double hit. We have the risk that we carry on increasing the deficit on the special needs block, which itself is bad enough, but if we, if we do that, we also, as I understand it, will not get our deficit written off. We get hit twice. Now that is massive, and, and so I, what I was hoping to see today was a financial paper that actually gave us an indication of what the impact was on those issues and where it would hit the council. Because my guess is it would hit the council in the general fund and in the council tax payers account. And, and I think we need to understand that. Um, I'm very grateful for all the work the Schools Forum has done and is doing. But their responsibility is delivering on, on the school's service. It's not actually responsibility of delivering the balanced budget for the authority. And you know, I, I've outlined my concerns, but, but somehow between resources and audit and probably overview and scrutiny management, we need some pretty sound reassurances given pretty quickly. And at the moment, I, I don't feel they're there. But I'm, I'm very open to being persuaded. Thank you. Okay. Um, Denise, do you want to respond to that at all? <coughs> okay. so, um, so all of the details are in various reports as opposed to all being contained within this report. But I think colleagues have tried to pull together the graph that you see in 5.2 which shows you your extrapolation line of your unmitigated forecast. If you are really saying, well, you know, how, how bad can this get if we don't turn the curve? Then it's the extrapolation of your unmitigated, which is your do-nothing scenario. Your blue line on the graph is the, the plotting of the graph based on the mitigations that have been outlined by colleagues and things that are being pursued to try and turn the curve. And clearly they're going through the details in terms of the plans uh, that are being 
being proposed and the areas being explored as part of that. You are correct. It isn't a, you know it isn't easy because we we are looking at whole systems, but there's been a lot of detailed work, diagnostics and uh, analytical work undertaken by the team and also by the DfE, looking at benchmarking, looking at alternative data, which indicates the areas of which uh, one that Bristol is an outlier, but other in areas where we need to focus. A lot of focus being put on specialist provision because a lot of where we are expending is out of authority placements. So actually, if we're able to deliver on some of those back ambitions about in authority provision, then that will start to reduce the the cost um, in terms of the unit cost of you know of providing the need uh, for each uh, each child at each of the cohorts. So the two come together. The proposals and the proposals that aim to bridge that gap. But what you want is a more detailed schedule, which basically gives you the numbers behind each of those, of which we will have, but maybe not in, in this format. But it's generally in the papers that go to school four, which will give you the table with the data and the figures. And I'm not sure what's in the next set of slides, but it may be in there, but we can probably go through that in a bit more detail uh, as well and just talk through uh, some of the detailed propositions. I think if you're asking in relation to the statutory override, again, that's in all budget papers. I think you see that often at the statutory override, when the statutory override ends, and how much time we have to be able to come up with a, you know, a detailed plan that shows the right trajectory and the right delivery. Okay, um, I have a feeling we might be picking this up again at some point. Uh, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, three quick things. Firstly, we got the numbers in the that haven't, that haven't yet uh, been dealt with fully. So could we have the numbers that are actually in train and do not yet have the necessary certificate? Secondly, I'm very concerned with my experience both in schools and from uh, you know, casework as, as counsellor, that there is a significant differentiation between those middle class parents who know what buttons to press and get things for their children and some of the, uh, should we say, less uh, uh, advantaged parents who suffer in silence their children and sometimes their conditions are significantly worse. And I'm not seeing anything which indicates uh, the, um, a, a determined effort to actually tackle that problem. And thirdly, I share Councillor Gollum's concerns I, you know, I've seen some of these uh, proposals and I've heard them over the years. Not only have the figures been getting worse steadily, but I've got things which are practically motherhood and apple pie. And you have to say, why have these not been delivered? And what confidence can we have now that they will be? We can't say why they haven't been delivered because we've not been here. I guess what we can say is that we're confident in the plans that we're putting together, the financials that go behind them, um, and I think as you, you'll see in, in stage two of this meeting, are, are achievable. Um, but this, I guess that the EHCP world is not a fixed, finite world. Tomorrow, four children can be assessed and need £200,000 worth of um, treatment a year. That would be a, 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 nearly another million pounds a year. We have to provide and meet those needs. Um, that's, that's what's um, required. So there are a lot of variables in this, and what we're trying to do is model the things that we can control and we can engage with, and I think our plans to reduce um, our dependency on the independent, non-maintained schools is our biggest chance of achieving success. Um, we're looking at around £50,000 worth of saving per child if we can meet those same needs being delivered through an expansion of our provision locally. Um, but I can't, I can't give you guarantees. Sorry? So, so our current average um, of 20 weeks 
to a grave to our backlog is around 250 cases. That's on the backlog for assessment. So we have, a, we have 193 who have been assessed who are waiting for their appropriate placement. Okay, thank you. I, I've, I'm conscious that I've got Councillor Townsend and Councillor Parker is trying to sneak in, um, but I'm also conscious that you know the time is running away. I was keen to give this um, some time though in the public forum because I think that's important. Um, I'm just going to use Chair's privilege and follow on from Councillor Hawkins' questions about uh, how realistic the figures are. Um, uh, with a starter question, which is there's two, just over two million worth of uh, mitigation slash savings in this um, in the um, blue table on page 165 uh, for the 23 24 tax year, and we're all you know we're obviously um, happy through that already. So are we confident in delivering those savings in this year? Let you know. Um, Given that you know, obviously, longer term, you know, things are maybe more avoidable, more difficult to predict. But in this year, um, are we going to deliver those savings? They're actually a reviewed savings, so the original savings, because there was a delay in in the start of this program because of um, because of funding from the DFE as well. So the delivering better value with. In SEND program can begin until June, where in the original work that we did with the Department for Education, that was due to start in January, but that was indicative timings we were working on. So we have reviewed these savings targets over the year um, and we are continuing to reflect on them. Um, it is it is hope we'll be close to that level of saving. Okay, thank you. Councillor Townsend, and then Councillor Harker, and then I will bring this session to a close and we'll go into the exam session. Thank you. You just asked my question, Chair. One of them. One of them. Um, there are two mentions of school forum in this, and one of the presenting officers has mentioned school forum. I want to say a few things. The September school forum was not in the public domain, and I am following that up with the monitoring officer because it's a legal requirement that the public is allowed access to school forum uh, meetings. So that scrutiny, whatever questioning has come forward from the leaders of every sector about papers that we went to September, we are not yet, we're not aware, we don't know yet what issues they raised. I just want to make that as a point. The second point about the school forum is that they actually made very, very few decisions. The vast majority of decisions of the local authority, they had to consult with the school forum, but actually it's the authority. The entirety of the high needs budget is down to the local authority. Um, I would like to ask a question about the government's um, sort of diagram of 5.10. Are there any areas within that governance table that by law requires the presence of the lead member for children's services within it? Secondly, which um, have political representation on them, because obviously nobody in this room, there isn't any opposition representation there. Um, and then I've got a couple of questions in relation to Appendix A, if that's okay. Uh, because it's Appendix B. That's yeah. Okay. I'm just then. Yeah, I'm just. I'm, I'm paranoid about this. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it says that, uh, so Appendix A talks about 288 additional special school places between this September and next September. Do we know if we're on course to uh, deliver those by set for opening in September next year? Um, that we, we are looking at um, some delays in some of those, some of the, the actual 
Um, projects themselves are quite complex in some of the buildings that we're trying to refurbish to provide the specialist places. Um, we should be on track for the majority of those spaces for this um, for this this phase, um, but but there are a risk on one or two of those. Okay, can we get a breakdown as to where we are then? With because it's pretty crucial that we get the places because it's the places that are out of area that we know are the real big costs, not only in relation to the high needs but also to the homeschool travel, which is our general fund. Um, and what I had uh, one more question, and it was really about the table that looks at the delivery of the projects. It's quite out, it's quite out of date. And I'm just wondering, Chair, if that's because it's audit and you look back at stuff. Because I'm, I mean, I'm aware that some of these projects are more further forward than what's being reported. Which table is that? So, um, so the one on page one six five, which might mean nothing to you because you're maybe not looking at the audit papers. <laughs> Name of scheme, status, narrative. A1, A2? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and it go, it's just that I'm aware that there's a number of things in here that, have, that are further forward as we speak than are what are reported here. And it might just be that this is audit and you look back. Um, so the consultation is out, isn't it? For example, around top up. Yeah. And it says here that you're about, you're gonna do it. And some of the dates are quite old. This, this was the uh, list of updates where we were, where we were, was taken to Cabinet in October. So the, the dates reflect that. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hucker, um, you have sn sneaked under the radar, so one last question, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to gain a greater understanding of um, the, the, the financing of the um, deficit on the DSG. Um, as I understand it, the deficit is effectively being carried forward as a kind of negative reserve. Um, but if the um, statutory override is not extended beyond uh, 2026, um, I believe it will need to be written off against a, a, a usable reserve. Um, but, but I can't actually see any usable reserves in the accounts that it could be written off against. Um, so I wondered what the scenario would, uh, would then be. And also, um, I'd like to know how the um, deficit is currently being funded. I, I assume it's from existing cash services, uh, which arose as a result of uh, borrowings uh, from the Public Works Loans Board. Uh, which, in, which themselves, I guess, would have been drawn down um, to finance capital expenditure. But as, the, as there has been significant slippage um, in the capital programme, it appears to me that, um, the, the, that the surpluses are funding this deficit. Um, I, I'm happy to be corrected on that, and I hope I will be corrected on that. Um, but but I, I'd like some assurance of the key point as to what happens if the statutory override isn't extended uh, and what reserve it would be written off against. That's probably one for me. So if we look at the way in which the, um, the deficit has built up over the years, uh, it's grown from a deficit of approximately 3 million to the position as at the end of the last financial year of close to 39, call it 40 million pound deficit, forecasted to be um, 58 uh, million deficit by the end of 23, 24 financial year. Uh, now this statutory override that was put in place will enable the local authorities to carry that as a negative reserve as you've outlined and to account for it separately, that's separately from your actual DSG balances, should you actually um, uh, have a surplus on a specific item, you, you'd have to separate that out. 
So carrying a negative reserve, you're carrying a negative reserve across all of the council's usable reserves. You don't allocate it against either or. So actually, if you've got surpluses in your school's reserves or any other usable reserves, it's really just carried as a negative reserve. In your balance sheet, you see the deficit line that builds up and will continue to uh, until we actually um, get to a position where uh, we get to a statutory override where there isn't the ability to then uh, continue to carry a deficit. At that point then there will need to be discussions with uh, DLAR, the DfE, our external auditors and also ourselves in terms of where are we in the programme, what is the plan, what is the approach and what other reserves are there available. We can't predetermine the outcome, we don't know what the reserve will be, we don't know what the decision will be by each of those bodies, uh, whether DLAR will extend further or not. Um, or what progress we would have made as a council in terms of actually starting to turn that curve and, and mitigate. We have obviously done some forecast in terms of where we think we will be in our mitigation plans if all of the matrix come to fruition. But there is also lots and lots of variables, lots of assumptions. There's also assumptions around future funding levels, etc. for each of the year of the deficit. Uh, so I think the only point that I'd make is that the will be a deficit still at the end, even if all of our plans come to fruition, there will still be a deficit uh, within the DSG. And I think the decision will be based on the level of progress being made, whether we're making a positive trajectory, etc., uh, and also the scale of that. And that will also be viewed of with, in terms of how much do we have in our schools reserves and a whole range of other reserves. Whilst we mentioned there are no useful reserves, the council has significant uh, useful reserves uh, at present, um, but reality, I can't say what the position will be at the end of 27, uh, when the statutory override initially comes to um, an end. Thanks, Denise. Okay, um, let's move on then to item 19, which is the exclusion of press and public. Um, so under section 100A, Brackets for the Local Government Act 1922, the public will now be excluded from the meeting for the following item of business on the grounds that it involves likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of Schedule 12A of the Act. So, 